Okay, so let's go into to begin practice number six. In this case, it's called organizational level in this course analysis. We are going to do one step more than we have done be, uh, until practice number five. So we are going to, I'm going to explain briefly uh, without much detail, this kind of analysis or this kind of um, studies come from, we borrow this in marketing from sociology and basically from so sociology. Uh, in their case, they are more interested in many tools that could be applied in this case. Because uh, soci sociological studies usually are qualitative and they try to understand an individual uh, in their within a, a, a set of people, within a society, a group of reference, a class, whatever. In our case, we are going to borrow this, this tool only to analyze customer experience and customer journey. So we are going to simplify. There are a lot of things we are not going to see. So I'm going to show you many things, but I'm going to tell you which of, the, of them are important. We're going to focus basically in two elements. The rest is for, for people that are interested in sociology. If you are interested, you can enroll in a subject, in the subject of sociology. So we are going to introduce basically, as usual, to explain uh, what elements we include in organizational analysis, uh, to explain the connection between elements or between factors and to explain the visualization in terms of networks. And of course, throughout the class, I'm going to explain you examples of last year. So following the same analogy that I, that I explained um, in practice number four and in practice number five, remember in practice number four, textual analysis, uh, the analogy I used was the, this astronomer was that was trying to watch the uh, sky, the different um, the different elements that it's like, like a general and a panoramic view. In the second level, in the practice, in practice number five, um, we uh, in, we try to identify each of these important ideas and we try to give a name to code these ideas. For example. If there were some ideas related to customer journey map before, we put that name to, it, to all these uh, ideas, or if they were related to experiential level, relational level, or any other thing. In this case, we assume that we have already uh, assigned a code to each of the ideas. And now we are going to try to associate, to find relationship between these codes. This is what we are going to try to do, one step ahead. So in this case, we are going to try to associate these codes or these families of codes into groups. We are going to try to find relationship between them. And an example, in this case, the analogy that comes to my mind is the kind of families of Game of Thrones, for example. We can have an idea or we can uh, compare our analysis with the map of families of the Game of Thrones. For example, each of the individuals, we can associate them, or we can uh, consider them as a code. So we have an individual, there are a lot of characters, you know, all the different uh, people that uh, is in this book. So each of them is a code. But all of them, are associated to families. We have the different families. I'm not an expert in Game of Thrones. I like it, but I, I'm not an expert. But as, as you see, we have the different families and they are linked in some way. And, I, and this is what we did in practice number five. We created code and we created families of code because they were associated in some way. Now, what we are going to do is to try to associate the different families. We have this family and this family. And we, Maybe they are together, or they are um, uh, they work together, or they fight together, or they are against. There could be many relationships. This is what we are going to do. Why? Because at the end, we want to have a visualization like, like this that summarizes all the things that we have found in our study. So um, once again, I come back with the same uh, slide that I usually use. The first level, the textual level, if you remember, in this uh, in this section or in this stage 
we had the objectives and we underline the relevant ideas. Just underline. In the second level, the concept conceptual or the contextual analysis, what we made, what we did was to uh, identify each of the, the sentences and try to associate this sentence to something. In our case, this something was the cost. The, well, I'm going to show you the different codes that we used were basically this. We try to associate the ideas with the different levels of the, 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 the different stages of the customer journey map before, during, or after, or the different um, relationship between the customer and the company, transactional, relational, or experiential, or another way was taking into account the customer experience generators. Based on environment, staff, whatever. So if you have done practice numbers, five, basically, you, you have done this. You have created the codes and the family of codes. So conceptual and contextual analysis. And now we are going to try to find the information in this large set of codes you have. You have a lot of codes, families. OK, what can we do with this? Can we associate them in some way? So this is what we are going to do. We are going to do two things. We are going to create, well, basically, uh, this is the, the structure of the study. As you remember, the first stage, determination of the study, field work, ana analysis, uh, the different level of analysis, uh, experiential perspective, that is the textual analysis, conceptual, interpretative, that is the one that we are doing organizational or interpretative. So as you see, we are very close to the end, which is the last one, the last level of analysis. So what, what are we going to do? Well, basically, when we talk about organizational analysis, it includes, it's, as, as, as I told you, it's a complex thing, a very complex thing, but I'm going to simplify it into two tools. Basically, when we are doing an organizational analysis, we need to consider the structural part and the interpretative part, like two parts. Uh, the structural part brings us closer to the hierarchical, hierarchical positions of the attributes, of the categories. So basically, uh, summarizing, I'm not going to talk about all these things, but basically, in our mind, in your mind, you need to uh, you need to have this in mind. Regarding the structural part, this is the thing that have to come to your mind. This is the structure of codes we have. But now the thing is, how are they related? If I put some arrows here to associate or relate concepts, how are they? Is this way? Is this way? How can we do it? Well, that we are going to see how. And this how or these relationships are included in the interpretative part. It brings us closer to the type of relationship between us. Why? Because there are many types of relationships. I'm going to give you a couple of examples, for example. Imagine I'm different from the, well, or similar, related to the studies you are doing. Imagine that we are analyzing customer journey map. And we have, a, we have um, a lot of opinions of individuals regarding the staff, but most of these opinions are negative, negative issues regarding the staff. For example, let's go into the to the end. I'm going to explain you my imagine negative opinion regarding staff. So if we have this, we need to see if, for example, this is associated with different levels of the customer journey, different stages of the customer journey map or different levels of, um, of a relationship between the client. For example, if we are talking about the staff, this staff is going to be related for sure with the relation. But maybe it's not going to be related with the transaction. So we cannot put all the arrows we want. We need to think in any case which arrow we want to put or not or why. 
Don't worry, I'm going to explain this step by step. So the first tool, a specific tool that we are going to use is called the semiotic table. There are four, well, there are more in sociology, but there are four that are usually used. We are going to use only from these four, only one. That is the semantic, the semiotic table. You, you can find examples of binary oppositions, semiotic tri triangle, tables and matrices. We are not going to talk about them, just the semiotic table. And why we are going to use the semiotic table? What is and why? We are going to use the semiotic table because one of the, if you remember, one of the objectives of our studies was related to the profile of the individuals. Remember, it was customer journey map, whatever, and also which type of people do we have? Is there any people specifically that like complain that are is very happy that profiling kind of segmentation, qualitative segmentation? So we are going to use semiotic table to summarize the type of individuals we have. But the characteristic of uh, the, the, the formal definition of semiotic table it is a representation of relationship between the distinctive features of a category. It's like to abstract. Why we are going to use it, for example, to identify different types of clients with different needs, complaints, interests, whatever. I'm sure you have read your interviews and you have realized that there are different people regarding your service. There is this kind of people that is willing or eager to experience, experience new things, but they are very little, they complain very little, but there are different types of people in terms of consumer. So as you see, here we have an example. This is just an example. We have four types of, or four categories of individuals, wise, critical, novice, modable. This is an example. Knowledge there are from experience. So wise people, Regarding, for example, a thematic part, is these people that have visited many times the thematic part. They are usually critical, but if they have visited the thematic part many times, they like it. They, criti they criticize based on a fact, for example. In the other opposite to wise, we have the novice people, these kind of rookies, the ones that have never visited, or at least they have visited one time, that for them this is new. They value discovering new things, whatever. Critical, critical people. The definition in this example is filter in consumption evaluation. When we talk about critical people, usually there are critical people with very little experience and critical people with a lot of experience. Critical people. I know you know people about like, like, like this. They come to a restaurant and they say, we are waiting too much to whatever. This is too, too expensive. This is not good. Critical people. And basically, multiple people. New customers open to advise. We are in a restaurant, the typical people that are open to try new things. And they always, always ask the kind of question like, uh, what do you recommend to me? Different people, different profiles. Why is it interesting using the semantic table to uh, find different profiles? Because in marketing, we are going to use different marketing tools regarding depending on each of these segments. It's not the same trying to convince a critical person that our service is good than a person that is whatever. So as, as you understand, we need to know which type of people are we targeting and which of them are facing more or less problems. And maybe all of them are facing problems of my service. My problems are then are different. Well, I'm recording, but please. Is 27. I have things in my world anymore. But we are a lot. It's not your case only. Uh, we were three at 10 past. Try to be on time. Because it's, if not, it's difficult. Okay, so this is an example, a generic example. I'm going to give you examples of last year. This is this from the Spanish group, but for, for you it's good because they are examples. This is the semiotic table created by a group that was doing the study of oceanography. 
last year in the Spanish group, for example. They found for group, in this case, wise, novice, rookie is the same as in the other in the example, but in this case, attentive, helpful, inattentive, unhelpful. This is different. So in this case, you don't need to copy exactly what you see on the slides, but you can be innovative because maybe there are four types of clients, but different from yours for, for your service. Or not. But what, what I find interesting from this is that they say these people, there is a group with this uh, description, visual description, you are showing different things. You are showing that there are different types of clients with different needs, different interests, different complaints, whatever. First. Second, it's not a matter of interpretation only, because they are giving quotations of what they say. They say, okay, there is a group that we consider that are wise regarding our service, that is Oceanographic of Valencia, thematic farm. But why do we consider this? Because we have some examples. As you see, this is quotation number one, and it says, first, Primary document, one one is the primary document and the line, for example. First primary document, first individual, four, two, four, four. In this way, you identify the individual or the primary document and the line, for example. Just within four, four, or one, or whatever. And in this way, you can show briefly in only one page what you mean. Why is why because of this? A, a helpful why because of this. You can put 10 examples or you can put three clear examples. I don't care about the number, but at least that is clear. Of course, the, the more the better. If there is only one idea that uh, supports one type of client, uh, that means that there is only one person of this type. This is not a group, this is only one person. Can you see my point? But what about if we don't have enough people? To make different well, at least you are going to have two in the interviews and you are going to have one focus group. Yeah, about five, five people, five, four people. Or you have six, group. six people you have. Two in the, in the interviews or one focus, six people. It's so not your problem. It's more the problem of people that only have two. Yes, the matter. Is, is there any problem with the listing? Instead of creating four different classifications, we create three? No, it's not a problem, but it's recommended three, eh, four. Mm -hmm. Try to fit it into four if possible. Try to fit it if possible. Of course, if you have a focus group and all of them have the same opinion, it's only, only one, one person. But if you have two and a focus group, it's not going to be difficult to find four. Of course, groups of people that are alone. Individuals that are alone and only have to do two in the interviews, they are going to find only two, the maximum. But in your case, four, it could be possible. If it's three, no problem. No problem. So here we have another example. This is a different example. This is a, from, a, from a, a final degree project that I, um, that I, uh, that we organize, well, I, um, how do I say, I dirigit, well, I managed last year. In this case, there were like um, seven in depth interviews or eight in depth interviews, and they found four profiles of people that were users of electric and hybrid, hybrid cars. It was the normies, saver, technological, and ecological, because they had different motivations and so on. So in this case, the normie with some idea supporting this, the saver, they buy this because it's cheaper or it can be cheaper in the mid or long term, technological and ecological. Just examples. And the last one, Dream Sea, Mediterranean Camp. This is another example. As you see, wise, rookie, uh, the same, critical and critical. Different profiles. Of course, it, the, the question of your classmate makes make sense because when we do a study, we are an actual study, we gather information from a lot of people, not four or five. We usually do 
regarding the information of 20 people, 10, 20, 30 people. For example, in the last qualitative studies we have done, we have developed like 10 focus group of six people. So, of course, in this way, it's easier. But uh, you don't have to forget that in this subject, what we want you to do is try to use a tool. Of course, we know it's not the optim optimal condition because the number of, of interviews I uh, ask you to do is small. I told you that in the first year, three years ago, the first year, the students did two in-depth interviews and two focus groups of five. We are, we are requiring less and less every year. And they didn't complain that day. Now, of course, if they were in this class, they were complaining, but, but they didn't. So, uh, so this is the first thing. Semiotic table, try to find profiles, I, different profiles. And uh, the second thing we are going to see is the net, are the network visualizations. In, in the network visualizations is what I told you. We are going to try to draw a map like this. It's not necessarily that it's too complex. I'm going to show you some examples that I find in some cases too complex. The problem of these visualizations is that they can be helpful if they are clear, if they are understandable, but sometimes when people do studies, they, they, they in, 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 include that so many so much information that it is not useful. I'm going to show you examples and why. Of course, you have the book. You are, we, are, we are going to see the video now. We are going to see all the steps. You have the book of Atlas BI. Here you have it. You can have a look, read all the things, cite if you want this in the study. Network views or network representations. As, you, as I put here in the slide, it eases or facilitated the, the visual presentation of the findings. I'm sure you, when we have finished uh, practice number five, in your mind, uh, you thought some of the rules. How can I summarize all this information uh, into simple ideas that could be actionable in a marketing plan, in a later marketing plan? How? But one way to summarize information are the network rules. What is a network view? This is a network view. I'm going to show you some here. For example, this is a network view. Don't worry, I'm going to explain you. It's too, too large from my point of view. But I want, I want you to see, so to look only to this part, to the bottom of the presentation, because this part is not useful for the purpose I, I'm going to for the thing I'm going to talk now. In this case, as you see, in this part, this part in red, this is squares in red. Basically, I, I know that it's small. This is the experiential level. This is the transactional level. And this is the relational level. And basically, forget about this part, please. This is not useful. Now, what this group D, this is Green C Mediterranean Cup, in this part of the graph, what they did was to try to relate, to find a relationship between the different levels, experiential, transactional, and relational, and the customer journey map, uh, perdón, the uh, customer experience generator. So it's, it's not necessary to put all the information together. You can create different graphs. So it's better to have, instead of a graph like this, to have three graphs or two graphs with different information. For example, imagine that I want to do one of these, one, one network view, and I have all this information. If I put all this information together, the different stages of the customer journey map, the customer experience generator, and the different levels of relation between the client and the company, I can put everything together in a block, it's going to be something like this. And my question is, how difficult is to read this, to explain this 
and more important, which kind of conclusions I can extract from a graph like this. It's difficult. So too much information is not information. My recommendation, my personal recommendation, is, and is what I usually do when I do this kind of start, uh, uh, analysis, is to try to find relationship between the three levels, two by two, for example. I can create one network, for example, with this. I usually like putting this part, the different stages of the customer journey map, in order before, during, and after. Why? Because it's natural. When someone comes to your business, or well, the first thing they do, they look for information about your company, all the steps you explain in the control number one. Afterwards, they come to your office, they experience, afterwards, they, this is natural. So it makes sense to use this as a central element of, of your network. Whenever you create, you can put this, or you should put this in the middle. And after all, you can say, for example, I want to find to see the relationship between this and this. Why? Because not all these customer experience generators are going to be are going to be equally important. For example, the staff in some cases is not going to be related in the before customer journey map before. It's not going to play any role here because the interaction basically. I, I, or in general, begins when you come to a company. Unless you have, for example, a telephonic attention or something like that. that but if, if the interaction, if there is no interaction between the individual, the client and the company before, the staff is going to disappear or is going to be less important. What we want to see is, for example, how important are these elements regarding the three stages of the customer journey. And this could be, for example, one graph, one network visualization. You create a network, you put the different arrows, and you interpret the information. Once you have done this, you can forget about this, and you can create this, the relationship between this and this, and explain. And maybe some groups, they find that, okay, but it, it could be also interesting to relate this and this. So you can create a third one and explain step by step. In this way, you can extract five, two, three, four ideas from each of them. And this is like the conclusion of your study. It's, it's easier. Instead of having all the information in one, you can do it partially, step by step. This is a recommendation. Some people, for example, they consider Imagine, in your study, maybe it makes no sense to make to mix this with this. Perfect. But at least what I want you to do is to understand why network views are important, how to create them physically, how to select the code, how to relate them, and extract some ideas. Is it clear? So uh, here you have the example I told you. This is what we are going to do at the end, step by step. And this is what was done in the final degree project regarding hybrid and electric cars. In this case, the variables or the codes were different. There was not customer journey map. They were different, different concepts. So the things here are different. This is a technology acceptance model. In next year, in in quantitative uh, marketing uh, research, we are going to, be, to see this technology acceptance model. But at the end, what are we going to do at the end? Now, I'm going to explain it with this example, and we are going to do it. Or at least I'm going to explain the steps. Then when we want to do a visualization like this, the first thing, we need to select the element we want to put in the graph. So we are going to go to the code manager, we are going to select the code, and we are going to say, Create network. And it's going to put like, like in the whiteboard, the different codes. Once we have the code, we have we can move the codes as we want. We can drag these codes to put it as we want. And the second, the last thing is to put the, the, the arrow to relate things. If they are associated, if they are contradictory, if they are whatever. We're going to see this in a while. So 
Uh, in this case, I, we are going to use a video, two videos. This is an introduction, three minutes, uh, to explain you br briefly why it's interesting and how to start creating. And the second one, I'm going to stop the video and explain a little bit more, okay? Let me see if it works. Help. Creating networks in Atlas TI 9 windows. Why and what for? In this video, we show you a number of example networks in order to give you an idea of how you can utilize this function of Atlas TI for your own work. If you want to learn how to create networks, take a look at our How to Create Networks video. You'll find a link below in the comment field. This is a messy network. You can use it to organize your thoughts and ideas, develop a storyline for your report, or organize your data around a core category if you are doing a grounded theory analysis. In the following, we show you how you can develop such a network. You begin by creating a new network. As you see, the first thing they have said is, this is a messy network. Mm -hmm. This kind of network are useless. Uh, in the past, or and probably this year, people that are not in class and they are not hearing, they, are, they have the video, but they are not hearing uh, um, uh, like this, this uh, presentation, they are going to know how to create a network, but they are going to put all the information together because it's like, okay, the lecturer wants us to do this, so we're going to do it. Not do it thinking, do it step by step, considering do, doing two or three. And now we are going to see how to create. It's very easy to create a network. You are going to see. Create a network with the name. Let's assume you want to develop a storyline for your report. Add all codes. As you see, they have selected the codes. They have selected the codes and they have created. This is the whiteboard and they are putting all the information together. One by step by step. The network that you think are relevant for the storyline. Then begin to connect them and think about how they are related to each other. As you see, how to connect them? Very easy. We're going to see this later. But technically, very easy because you drag from one to the other and you click on one, you go to the other one, and it creates a, an arrow. And this arrow, you need to put the type of relationship you think that there is. If they are related, if they are associated, if they are opposite, opposite. Sometimes, for example, we have uh, we are talking about <clears throat> we are talking about, uh, for example, um, uh, ecological awareness. This is something that we are using a lot in sustainable consumption. Ecological awareness and willingness to pay. Usually, a person that has a high ecological awareness is willing to pay more. A low is going to pay less. So we can find a put a relationship there because we consider that if this is, high, is greater, the other one is going to be greater. Sometimes there are other kinds of, of, of for example, um, ecological awareness and um, uh, climate change uh, skepticism, for example, people that usually are more skeptic about the climate change is opposite to ecological awareness. People that are very aware of the problem, they are usually less skeptic. As you can see, this can be a direct or a, a positive or a negative relationship. By doing that, and by arranging the codes on the canvas, a great deal of analytic work occurs. Atlas TI does not suggest the relations. It is all up to Look at this. When you put everything on the whiteboard and select one, like this, when, whenever you select, it appears a circle here. And this is the thing you need to put the, the, the mouse here and drag it to the other one that you want to relate to, the circle. To you and how you link your codes. 
In a network, everything that you've learned so far about the data comes together. Atlas TI comes with a few... Have you seen what they have done? Instead of creating one, two, three, four, five, five arrow, what they have done is to select all of them and put only one arrow and five arrows at the same time are created. You can do it one by one or in groups. Default relations, but you can add any relation that you need to tell the story that emerges from your data. are compared with the answer to a research question. In the network, this network visualizes the answer to a research question. In the network, two respondent groups are compared with regard to their changes in attitude over time. The memo describing all of this is also included. The contents of the memo in combination with the network can be used for a section in a report or a chapter in a thesis. Here in our Children and Happiness Sample Project, this network shows the relationship between attitude and... Well, here, I think it's this, this is the useful thing from the first video. We're going to jump to the second one where they talk more about the relationship itself. I want to... How to create networks in Atlas TI 9 windows. Here you see the code manager. The density for all codes is zero. This means that codes have not yet been linked to each other. And you have you seen what they have said? We have all the code. This is the number of times that the code is repeated. You can see you have already seen when you have created uh, created practice number five and density is the number of relations is coming or going out from one. And if we have, for example, one code that has density, density seven, that means that it's related in our network seven times. Maybe either they receive an arrow or they send an arrow. In this case, it's zero because no, there's no, there are no relationships created. You can begin creating a network by selecting codes in the code manager or any other code list. Right-click one of the selected codes and select the option Open Network. Open network. Another way to add codes or other entities to a network is via drag and drop. Exactly. You can do it this way, select all of them and drag and drop, or so put them all, or you can go one by one. Create your, your whiteboard and go one by one. You can put them in the order you want, and you're going to see that there are all, uh, some alternatives to that the program, this version, allow you to organize the, pro the, the, the codes so it's better, it's easier to understand. We're going to see later. A third way is via the nodes tab. Then click on add nodes. You can add items via drag and drop or select multiple items and click add. All items in a network are called nodes. You can no. grab each node with the mouse and move it to a different position. To link nodes to each other, select a node and drag the little circle that appears at the top left to another node. Let go of the mouse and select a relation from the list provided. This is what I told you. Okay. In these two examples, what they are doing is like too automatic. They select any code just for you to see how to do it. But when we are doing a, 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 a network view, we have to carefully think what are the concepts we are using? What are the codes? If we don't need to put arrows between everything. I don't know if you understand me. For example, if we have customer journey map before, during, and after, it makes sense, for example, having an arrow like this between them. Because, of course, the first thing that happened is that you look for information, whatever the before happened always, done, before, done, the actual experience. Okay, so one second. It may, this this kind of relationship may make sense. What it, it doesn't make sense is this before, because we always begin the experience by looking for information. And can you see the point? So what they are doing here now is just putting out. 
But this part, when they have created one arrow from this node to this node, the question is, which type of relationship are we talking about? And it's difficult to see because the video is not very clear, but I'm going to show you, and I'm going to extract you now, the different types of relationships that you usually include. Sorry, question? Uh, for example, we have some number five in three different other documents. So... It's a problem. What can we do? You need to have everything in the same. Everything. Yes. Because uh, the analysis must be done in only one hermeneutic unit. Well, don't worry. There is one way. Question. You have used three hermeneutic units. See? Do you, do you have different primary documents? Mm, yeah. I mean, one of them, for example, two in depth interviews, the other one this way? Uh, in depth interview number one, number two, and the publisher. Okay. But the codes are the same? Exactly the same? Okay, you, you don't need to, it's not difficult. What you need to do is to merge hermeneutic units. There is one alternative in the, in the software that is called merge, fusion in Spanish. And it allows you to merge. So you can, what you can do is, if you have, and you, can, you cannot do it in one, you need to do it in, if you have hermeneutic unit number one, an hermeneutic unit number two. What you can do is, first of all, you open this one. When you have opened this one with, with the program and open this one, you go to this here. Well, this is the network manager, but the, the main program, and you find in the first, uh, let me see if here we can see the First, without the code manager, let me see. Well, you find the option merge hermeneutic unit. And what it's going to tell you is, okay, you have already opened hermeneutic unit number one. And it's going to ask you, with which hermeneutic unit do you want to mesh, mix this? And you are going to select hermeneutic unit number two. So where what it's going to create is a new hermeneutic unit that is going to include one and two. Once you have done this, great. You save it to avoid losing information. You go to this document and you put the, again merge with hermeneutic unit number three. And it's going to create a new one called, you can put the name you want, Pinot, for example. And in theory, this one is going to do one, two, and three. But when you merge the hermeneutic unit, you need to tell the program different, if it's different primary document, same code. Why? Because the program is not clever. It's not intelligent. Artificial intelligence, intelligence is clever in some way, but these programs are not clever. That means if you may mix these two and you don't say to the program that, that they are using the same codes, it's going to duplicate the codes. For example, staff, if it defines the staff in the first primary document, and the staff in this document is going to consider it as different. It's not going to put it the same. So when you say, this document has different primary documents and that same code, it's, go it's going to mix the codes. Can you see the point? This is why I ask you, are code exactly the same? When there is a capital, there is a capital space, exactly the same. If they are exactly the same, perfect. You can do this and in, some minutes you can put all together. And you can do practice number six with this document. Last year, I explained in class the merge option, but I have eliminated this year because I want to ease the subject. Maybe for next year I have to explain. 
It's not difficult. Merging is not difficult. So if you haven't understand this, and I hope you have, if you haven't, you can go to um, to Atlas TI website and you can put on oh, YouTube merge. It's going to explain step by step. It's very easy. Okay. So let's go into you can grab each, let go this. of the mouse and select a relation from the list provided. Here you see the standard relations that come with the software, plus a few user-defined relations. As you see, look at this. These are the, the relationships that you can put between two nodes or two concepts. Are you contradicts? If I have one, con one concept or one element that contradicts another one, I can put a, a, an arrow that says this contradicts this. It's the opposite. Different between, they are different, uh, is a, imagine we have uh, one element that is conformed by different elements. Imagine that you have, for example, um, different types of clients. And this type of client is, to define this type of client, there are four characteristics. A person that is uh, normie means this, this, and this. So these characteristics are part of the definition of Norway. A saver client, a person that uh, uh, is looking at or want to optimize the value of their money, maybe there are some characteristics. So this characteristic is a, is part of. So this is a, or is part of, are very similar. Not exactly the same, but very similar. It's associated with, for example, we, uh, sometimes we have customer journey map before, during, and after. And sometimes there is association, a person that is uh, satisfied or that per have a good perception of the previous stage, also have a, a good perception of the next stage. So if there is a relation, it's related to, or is associated to. There are many, but in general, we use three, four, not more. I'm going to come back to this later. You will learn later in the video how you can later. create your own relations. Next, we show how to link multiple codes at once. You can either draw a frame around the codes you want to link, or you select two or more codes holding down the control key. Next, select the link option from the ribbon. Now multiple. As I told you, to create a link, if you have, for example, five characteristics and you want to create five arrows, you don't need to create it one by one. You can select both and you can go to link and create both at the same time. But you can do this only if they are of the same type. I mean, these two, maybe they are, there is, is associated. So if they are exactly the same, you can create it. I don't like creating uh, multiple relationships. I usually go one by one. Lines appear. Move the mouse pointer to the code where these codes should be linked to and select a relation. If none of the existing relations fits the link you want to make, then you can also create a new relation in the process of linking. Yeah, this new relation. Enter a name for the new Forget relation. Forget about this new relation. Should prop if there is an existing direct mm. or indirect link, as here between documents and. One second. Let's add a few other entity types via that. Until now, what we have done is to put in the graph only codes or family of codes. I can put a family or a code, just selecting and dragging. But sometimes imagine that you can have this code and maybe there is one quotation or one memo that you think would be interesting to put in the graph because it's very clear, like, a, like an example. So you can use it. You can select the, the quotation or select the memo and drag it into the graph. In the graph, you can create, you can put codes and familiar code or any other kind of entity. This is the example option. that is going to do. If there is an existing direct or indirect link as here between documents and codes, lines are immediately drawn. Document code connections are displayed via a blue dotted line. 
The quotation just added is part of document three, and therefore this link is also shown. Quotation 132 is not linked to anything yet in this network. Quotation 311 is part of document three and coded by one of the codes in the network. Other entities you can add are memos, all entity groups, and other networks. So these are all the things you can include. Now, I think this is enough. You can have a look to the, to the full video, but these are the, the elements we need. But the most important question probably for you is, okay, relationship. I think when I see this video or this explanation, the, the first thing that comes to my mind is, okay, if I have this, which type of relationship I'm going to put? If I click on this customer journey map before and I drag the arrow from this to this, which type of relationship should I put? Because there are many. If I uh, want to relate this, for example, to the three, to the three, to the three, how can I do it? Is the same type of relationship, is different, well, these are the typical relationship we include in a customer journey map. Sorry, in a network visualization. There are more. If you remember the display, the word more, usually they are not commonly used. These are the most commonly used. Contradicts is A, is associated with, is called not, is part of, whatever. These are the ones we use. When we need to use them. If we have two elements that are opposite, we use contradicts or A is opposite to B. So we find we, we look at the, the, the list of relationships and we find either contradicts or opposite, because depending on the version, they use one word or the other. Opposite. Because for us, maybe it's clear that when this happens, the opposite happens. If a person uh, for example, complains about the time, so the customer experience is going to be lower. So whatever the time is great, longer, the, co the, the customer experience is lower. So there is a, an opposite relation. A is A. A is an example of B. Imagine that I have one situation and one concept is an example of this uh, family. Is associated to, this is the most used, is associated or is related. Why? Because when we, call, when we uh, tell uh, or when we draw this kind of relationship associated that you see in this one, is associated, I usually say that it's a conservative relationship. I mean, I'm going to explain myself now. In a way. Before. So. If I create this kind of causal relationship, I'm assuming that the relationship is only this way, linear, okay? But it's not always like this because customer journey map, of course, if a person is visiting the thematic park, for example, one time, this stage is going to be, is going to be in this stage only one time customer journey map, all the things that happened before, the during, or the after. So if we see there is relationship between the different stages, the relationship is going to be always this way. Is it clear? Because the person cannot come back. Is it clear? But what happens if the person comes to this restaurant, for example, for the first time, they experience this, but they come again. If they come again, this after, during, could be relationship to the before. 
could be related. Because imagine, they there are things that happen in the during in the first in the first experience that could condition the second experience. So this is why I told you that this relationship arrows are more conservative. Because you you can you assume that there is association, but there is not a causal relationship. First happened one and the other one happened after. I, I know this is conceptually difficult, but uh, east goes up. This is what I told you. This, this kind of arrow, this is cause of cause effect. Sorry. This is cause of. This cause of uh, means that this is a relation is related to or associated. Is more generic. It's more conservative. It's, if we don't have a clear idea that the arrow is this way, you, we can use the one that is uh, with two with two inside a symmetrical relations. And is part of is very similar to is a. It's an example of So in general, which type of relationship we use? For example, take a This is perceived utility. This is the perceived utility of an electric car, for example. Perceived utility. And this person, the one that have done this study, have related perceived utility to our own, is associated with intention to use. Why? Because it's a conservative way. She could say, no. The more perceived utility, the more intention to use. And put the arrow only this way. But it's, this is this study was um, an exploratory study, a beginning study, and it was not clear. So in general, it's better to use is associated with. As you see, in many cases, in this case, sustainability is contradicts. Um, no, I don't remember what it means. Car hybrid, but this between this context there is a contradiction, and there is part of here. As you see, there are some in general. The most used is is cause of and uh, is associated with. The ones we use more is cause of is associated with. In this case, as you see, they ha she has put a lot of um, a lot of um, codes. And in some cases, she have used some quotation as example. In this case, some quotations as example. You could you could use them, or you it's not compulsory to use a quotation. So this is the idea. You need to think about um, different ways to show the information. I'm going to probably in the next class. In the, in the next week, I'm going to show you some examples of the previous year of this visualization, better than the ones that I've shown you today. But I want you to work for one week uh, without the examples. Why? Because last year I showed, this is why I'm explaining the, the, the today's class with the video, because I know I don't want to show you the, the, the outcome, because if not, you are going to copy. Last year, I, I gave this, this outcome, and all the different visualizations were my visualizations, exactly the same. They were copied. So I don't want you to copy. I want you to try. So uh, what do we want to, what do we have to do for, week to, for this week? Well, think about your goals, your gold book, you practice number five, and if you need to change something, I think you are not going to change. But uh, section number one, it de depends on what you have done in uh, practice number five. If practice number five is organized, customer experience, journey map, and all these things. So if in practice number five, you have followed, sorry, this, more or less, you don't have to do anything in section number one. Just for because there are people that have it. 
Uh, second, create the so use the semiotic table to find different client typologies. Two, from three to four, three to four, if possible, uh, three to four. And remember, find the typologies and find examples with quotation. How many? Three, four, good. It's better having three that are specific than 10 that most of them are useless. Question. In our case, that we don't have uh, three interviews, it's like maximum. You are going to maximum three, yes. And if there are two interviews, in some cases, two interviews, two, probably two. If not, if it's not possible to do this, you need to explain just that. But three, you are going to find three at least. Yeah. And in the last one, pros, pros, several graphic representations you'd, you're using network based visualization. That means try to create two or three visualizations and explain them a little bit. What do you understand? How how you have done this and why? And to do this, one week. It's very fast. To do this practice is very fast because once you have practice number five with all the codes, it's a matter of minutes. It's dragging, creating the lines, it's easy. The most difficult thing is what you have done until now, practice number five. Okay, so this is what you need to deliver. Um, a, do a Word document with the semiotic table and the, the, the uh, hermetic unit uh, with the network visualization. And we are very close because next week I'm going to stop recording. Next week, one second.